Today in our first reading, the Lord establishes a new covenant. He prophesied through the uh, uh, prophet Jeremiah that God will establish this new covenant. And it's not going to be like the old covenant with, that has a pillar of cloud and a big fire that leads the people out of Egypt. It's not going to be like that. He says that I will not lead them by the hand out of Egypt. But God leads us out of another Egypt, another slavery, sin, of course. And the prophet, God speaks to the prophet Jeremiah and says that I will put my law within them and write it upon their hearts. So God's going to speak through us in our heart of hearts, right? God says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer will they need to have anyone teach their, teach their friends and relatives how to know the Lord. So how are we going to come to know God? God says, all from least to greatest, big and small, poor and rich, don't matter. All shall know me, says the Lord, for I will forgive their evil doing and remember their sin no more. That's super profound if you think about it, that that is how we will know we are serving the authentic, real God, the God who can do all things, the God who is worthy of trusting. That T word, sometimes a bad word. We've talked about that before, right? We don't know how to trust because the people around us aren't always so trustworthy. But I trust God. I know I'm supposed to. And how will I know that he's trustworthy? Because he will forgive our evil doings and remember our sins no more. And of course, last week, we had Leitare Sunday, the rejoicing Sunday, the day that we praise God in the midst of this miserable Lent, quote unquote. We praise God and we heard that very famous gospel, right? God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that we might have life. John 3, 16. And we know, or established, God is revealing himself as a good father who's worthy of trust. But on this Lenten journey, we continue. We continue today, and we see that even the Gentiles are coming to Jesus. They, like us, sometimes just ask, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. I'd like to see him. I'd like to have an opportunity to talk with him. Of course, prayer is the answer, of course, to that question. But we wonder, why do I come to Jesus? Is it out of, of course, trust, out of love, like we talked about last week? Or is it, sir, I'd like to talk to Jesus because I got a few things to tell him. Jesus, I got a few beefs with you. Jesus, I'd like to see you so that I can reprimand you for the things that you've done in my life or in my family or in my friends or in this world or to this country that I love so much. I'd like to see Jesus to give him a piece of my mind. Is that how a son and daughter comes to their father? Dad, I'd like to tell you what you've been doing wrong. I like video games. You can't be serious. You're going to take that away just because I didn't clean my room? You got another thing coming. You know what I'm going to do? When I'm old enough, when I'm big enough, when I'm strong enough, I'm going to leave this place. Okay. How are you going to get dinner tonight, little five-year-old Andy? You'd like to tell me a few things, but I'd like to reveal a few things to you. I provide for you. I protect you. I love you. Even when you don't clean your room, I still love you. But I'm trying to teach little Andy how to clean up his room so that his wife, when he has one, doesn't have to clean up his room for him. Oh, now I get it. Well, gosh, I guess Fortnite doesn't matter too much, does it? But how will we know this God is trustworthy? How will we know how he's speaking to us? How will we know when he's speaking heart to heart to us? 
when he forgives us of our sins and wipes them away. This is why Jesus tells us in our Holy Gospel today that the grain of wheat must die. Jesus has the Gentiles coming to him, so he uses a universal analogy. He doesn't just use something that's particular to the Jewish people, right? He doesn't talk about the Good Samaritan. That might be a particular parable for the Jewish people because they'd know what a priest is, what a Levite is. They would know what a Samaritan is, right? They would know how despicable it is for a Samaritan to touch a Jewish man who's bleeding and just was robbed. And for that Samaritan, that despicable human being, to take care of a Jewish man, take him to an inn, pay for his mending and his healing, pay for his hotel room. That's a Jewish parable, right? But now as Jesus gets closer to the passion and death, he's revealing himself, of course, to the Jews, but he's revealing himself to the Gentiles too. So these gent Gentiles come to Jesus and they say, they, well, they come to Philip, of course, who's their friend because he's from Bethsaida. And then Philip goes to Andrew, getting closer to Jesus, Gentile, getting close to Jesus because he's from Galilee, close by. Jesus. They're not in Nazareth yet. They're still in Galilee. Get closer. So Philip and Andrew come bring these Gentiles to Jesus. Sir, they want to talk to you. They've got an opportunity to have an audience with you. And Jesus says, now the kingdom's coming. The Gentiles are coming. So now I give a parable that's universal. A grain of wheat must go into the earth and die. Otherwise, it just stays a grain of wheat. They know that. They know that analogy. They've seen wheat. They see the seedlings. They see that the seedlings have to go into the earth. They've seen crops rise up, that God allows the grains of wheat to die so that it can bear much fruit. Universal. Everybody, not just Jews, everybody can understand this because it's an analogy of what Jesus is going to do for us. And Jesus adds to that, if you're going to be my disciple, you've got to follow in my way. You've got to die. You've got to lose your life like that little grain so that you may bear much fruit. That's the hard message. We like all the benefits. We like trusting God, love him, do good to others. Give to the poor. I like that. That's nice. But you tell me I got to die? I got to let go? I got to detach? Whoo! The hairs on your neck better stand up. Because now God's asking something of us that's difficult. But through the death and resurrection of Jesus, he conquers Satan. He conquers the kingdom of sin. And this covenant comes to fruition, right? It comes to fruitfulness. Because he will forgive our evil doings and forget our sins. Their sins will be no more. Even though they may be crimson red, they will be white as snow. They may be white as wool. Our sins are obliterated. But the contrast between the message of Jesus and the message of the world is that the message of the world tells you, of course, the question of society right now is what's in it for me? Click, like, subscribe, gain popularity. Watch me play the video game that I'm really good at. What's in it for me? Monetize YouTube for me. Come to me, all you who are labored and burdened, and I will give you entertainment. Huh? I don't want to be entertained. I want purpose. I want power. I want freedom. I don't want to be trapped in a 70-inch projection, high-definition television, running around as Pikachu or something. I don't want that for my life. It might be fun for 30 minutes or three hours or 30 hours or 130 hours. I don't know. But guess what? When you unplug, when you take out the controller, when you turn off the TV, you still got to be me. 
you still got to be you. So what's going to give you rest is the message of the gospel. The message that Jesus came so that we might have fun, yes. That we might be joyful, yes. That we might have great inventions, yes. But ultimately, I've got to die to self. I've got to recognize that there's more to life than just entertainment. More to life than just passing time. More than life than just becoming a couch potato in the field of society. There was that great, of course, uh, commercial that comes to mind at the Super Bowl where the guy, the Idaho farmer is up there and he's talking about how he's growing couch potatoes. I think it was for, I forget, one of those to be, to be uh, uh, channels or whatever, or uh, ways to stream. But he's growing a bunch of couch potatoes, men and women sitting on their couches in the middle of a field. And he's proud of himself because he's growing up a lot of couch potatoes. Why do we laugh? Because that's you and me. You and me. We sit down on that couch, grab the remote control, or we sit in front of the computer and veg. God didn't mean for us to be vegetables. He created vegetables for a purpose. That's not yours. But the message of what's in it for me, that's the message of the world. That message, of course, hits deeply because when we die to self, when we hear the gospel message and act upon it, follow Christ, we no longer ask, is this beneficial to me? What am I going to get out of this? Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. If, it's, if there's nothing I'm going to get out of it, you guys can go away. Forget about you guys. That can breed selfishness and pride. What am I going to get out of it? You're trying to preserve your life. Father Walter Chizek, who was a, a Jesuit priest who was a, a missionary to uh, Siberia and Russia, he went into the gulags because he was imprisoned. He stayed in a labor-intensive Serbian work camp for many years. But when he came back home, when he was finally free, people asked him, how did you get through it? What was the secret? He said, the secret was, I stopped looking for God's will. Huh? He said, because I found it. God's will for me was each and every day, in that moment, in those circumstances, doing what was in front of me. If all things work together for the good of those who love God, if all of these things, sufferings, joy, whatever it might be, if all of that works together for the good of us, then what is right in front of me, this circumstance, this moment, this situation, that is God's will for me. Father Chizek said, I had to change the way that I was thinking because I was trying to be a fortune teller and think about what's God's plan in the future so that I can do it right now. But God doesn't work like that. God works in this moment, in these circumstances, right here, right now. If you want to put it hip, hip and cool, of course, think about Eminem. You got one shot, one opportunity, right? You all have heard this song, if not at a basketball game recently. Goodness, you better hear it. But that's the thing, is that we have right now, right here, right now, the sacrament of the present moment. That God's will for me in this situation is right here and right now. In this moment, Lord, what do you want me to do? This, that I am doing. Sanctifying our daily life. Sanctifying our daily moments. Sanctifying what God is asking of you right now. A crying baby? Take care of it. Does it need to be fed? Does it need to be changed? Does it need to be held? 
Does it need to be loved on? Does it need to be put down? Does it need a nap? Does it need whatever? Sometimes we think it's not that simple, but it really is. Why? Because this is the secrets of the saint. This is the secret of the saints that they did God's will in the present moment, entrusting the past to God's mercy for his forgiveness that he might touch that misery of my past with his mercy and entrusting the future to his providence. God is a good God. God loves me. God is my father. He has a plan for my life. There is a future in store for me. Of course, it's in heaven, but even on earth, there's a future in store for me. But how do I get there? How do I fulfill God's plan? How do I fulfill God's will? This moment, these circumstances, this situation. That's the secret to the saints. You can go through St. Therese, St. Therese of Avila, John of the Cross, Ignatius of Loyola, St. Augustine, lust addict, doesn't matter. What is right now, right here? What do I need to do? What is God asking me? And that's also how we overcome our weakness, right? That's how we overcome any disabilities or weaknesses or even our sins. This is the beauty of the serenity prayer, the prayer of surrender, the novi surrender novena. God, I'm entrusting everything to you. Take care of it all. But I'm afraid. I'm afraid to trust him because he might take it all away from me. God never said, I'm going to rob you. Remember? Do you remember that? In John 45, chapter 45, he said, God said, I will rob you of all of your belongings. I will take away everything that you have cherished in your whole life. I will be vindictive. There's no John 45. God is with us. And he is for us. And nothing can separate him from us. Neither death, nor life, nor principalities, nor anger, nor resentment. Romans 8 tells us, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Do I believe that? Because that is what makes suffering worth it. It starts with our family. When was the last time that you sat down and thought about within your family. When was the last time I served somebody? I know trying to get the kids, you know, to mass and everything going on. That's an act of service, absolutely. But I ask the question, because it comes up in our hearts. Do I try to honor with cheerfulness the request from somebody in my family, somebody in my friends, somebody in this community? Or do I start out with the question, why me? You can't be serious. Are you serious right now? Because that's the sacrifice. That's the dying to self. That's where it starts. God's will is right there for you to grab onto. And say, yes, Lord, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through you who strengthened me right now, right here in this moment. But if we start asking, why me? And complaining and getting bitter and resentful at the service that you're doing for your loved ones, people that you profess you would die for, your husband, your wife, your kids. If we start asking, why me? That is a habit that is very difficult to break and can rob us of peace, rob us, because then we're just labored and burdened. We're not finding the rest that comes in Jesus Christ. So we are called to be disciples of Christ. It entails suffering, yes. It entails dying to self, yes. Very, very, very difficult message. Very, very, very difficult commandment, small c commandment from Jesus asking us to do this. But St. John Paul II tells us 
in his, uh, I think it's an um, apostolic letter on suffering, redemptive suffering, he tells us that down through the centuries and generations, it has been seen that in suffering, there is concealed a particular power that draws a person interiorly close to Christ, a special grace. In suffering, there's a special grace. Special, meaning people don't usually get this grace except through suffering. He says, to this grace, many saints, such as St. Francis of Assisi, St. Ignatius of Loyola, and others, owe their profound conversion. They have gone through suffering, and their heart has been converted. John Paul II goes on, he says, a result of such a conversion is not only that the individual discovers the salvific meaning of suffering, so not just a message, God's trying to teach you a lesson, no. We know that it is salvific, but John Paul II says, above all, the person who embraces that suffering becomes a completely new person. Because St. John Paul II had Parkinson's, he became a new person. He attracted disciples of Christ. He, we could see the love he had, not only for those around him, but for the church, that he suffered for the church, that he was an image of Jesus Christ for us. That's what the people in our lives who are suffering, if we are suffering, we become a beacon of light and hope to people who are discouraged and depressed by the things of this world, by the why me attitude, by the attitude of what's in it for me, by suffering, suffering with Christ, we become a new person. We radiate the love and mercy of God in a new way. So this is difficult, of course. And even Jesus, you hear it in the agony in the garden. He says, Lord, if, this, if you are willing, let this cup pass, but not mine, but your will be done, right? Did you know that St. John's Gospel doesn't have the agony in the garden? The agony in the garden comes from what call, what's called the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's Gospel has today's gospel, today's reading, as the agony in the garden moment. Jesus says, I am troubled now. Yet what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But it was for this purpose that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then the voice of the Father responds to Jesus. John heard this. His ears. John, the beloved disciple, the one who rested his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. He's going to do that later next week. He heard this. And he says, the father spoke and said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. So sometimes we ask the question, Lord, spare me from this hour. Should I say, get me out of here, Lord? No, like Jesus, we respond and say, for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Guess what? In God's providential plan, in his plan for humanity, in salvation history, you were meant for this time. You were meant to be in that pew, listening to this homily with whatever's on your mind. Possibly Father Andy stopped because the kids are getting anxious. We need to get out of here. I got to get ready for St. Patrick's Day. You were meant for this moment right here, right now. And that's just like not a platitude. Literally, God has chosen you with your weaknesses, with your disabilities, with your burdens and laboring for this moment to be a saint. 
That's how God's going to glorify it again and again and again and again and again. Glorify his name, the power of Jesus Christ, the power of the good news, the power of the confessional, the power of baptism, the power of the anointing of the sick. He's going to glorify it in your family, with your friends, in your job, with your husband, with your wife, with your kids, with those crazy nieces and nephews, with those insane grandchildren. God will glorify his name through you. In Christ Jesus, we will be glorified. That's part of his plan. So we were made for this time. And the secret of the saints is that right here, right now, in this moment, in this circumstance, I say yes to God. I say yes to what he is asking me, big or small. He will sanctify us. And so like those Gentiles that came to Jesus in our gospel, we want to see Jesus. Well, guess what? He's about to come to you. You wanted to see Jesus. You came to church today. You came to glorify God. You now are able to be united to him. Communion with God in your daily life, saying yes in this moment, in this circumstance, that's how you become a saint. And that's the secret of the kingdom of God.